welcome back to History of Graphic Narratives. So far we have been almost exclusively focused on the art of Europe, and I want to turn our attention now to a very important uh, traditions that were happening in Japan and China. Develops in China and is stimulated and developed by the government. The emperor has close control over who control, who does the printing and what is printed and all the materials that are required for printmaking are really under the purview of the emperor and the court. There is a small market for popular prints in China that starts to emerge. But literacy is really the purview of the royal courts. And so popular prints tend to be pictorial narratives of tutelary gods, such as this we see uh, the demon quelling uh, Chong Kui. And this woodblock print would have been a New Year's picture, which means people would buy these in the market stalls and they would decorate their homes on New Year's Eve. And as a approach the New Year's Day, they would celebrate this sort of um, auspicious moment with this image of the demon quelling God. And so this is the way in which most printmaking sort of disseminated and circulated among Chinese prior to the arrival of the Ming Dynasty. So this means for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, there really wasn't a, a popular press like there was in Europe, which stimulated uh, the activity of people making books and, and satirical images at a much earlier time. We see first popular images and words of uh, these sort of uh, detective stories. And, and China is the, has the also the credit of the oldest detective stories in the world. And these are called the Judge Bao stories. Judge Bao is not just a magistrate, he's also kind of an investigative uh, prosecutor. So he's kind of coming in and uh, learning about these horrible crimes. And these Judge Bao stories would have uh, one third of the, pic of the page uh, illustrated and two thirds uh, with the text. Now you can see the way the illustration kind of spills across two pages here, or one page, this sort of combination of words and pictures and the way in which they use these purge pictures, this becomes sort of the earliest attempt at creating a kind of graphic way of storytelling. And many of the conventions that we will follow in other parts of Asia uh, really begin here with the Judge Bao stories. This is a very important idea that Xiang Tu Xiaowen, which is this early uh, way of putting words and pictures together, is also a kind of formative area where um, the storytelling techniques are first begun. So now let's move to Japan. And Japan comes to storytelling. Uh, it's had a long tradition of storytelling, but pictures and publishing and writing comes fairly late to Japan, literally only a thousand years or more. Um, compared to China, which has at least 4,000 years of writing. And so in Japan, uh, these scrolls who told stories uh, that people would uh, travel around with these scrolls, with pictures, and they would tell these stories. And uh, they were Buddhist in nature. And uh, this is the way most people sort of got their entertainment. We talked about picture recitation uh, in Europe. Well, it really begins in India, and it sort of divides out from India over to Europe and then on to Asia. But they all represent a kind of common characteristics of people holding up pictures and telling stories um, and traveling around doing this. And that's something that has uh, spread outward from India. So this is something that takes root in Japan, beginning at around this sort of early the early uh, Kamakura period when Buddhism is thriving in Japan. Well, along with Buddhism 
is uh, picture traditions in Japan which are sort of playful and satirical, much more so than in China where the printmaking and the storytelling tends to follow either more serious uh, or uh, more conservative uh, tastes. In Japan, there's a sense of the wild and the uncanny and the strange and the playful that is sort of broadly called tobai. Okay, many people point to these early traditions of caricature in Japan and call it manga. I really don't want to use that word. It, manga does not exist in Japan at this time. This is a, a modern term and a modern idea. But we do see this wonderful, fun, and, and very playful images. Uh, the one at the upper center here, this is one we've already talked about. This is from the Heian era. This is the Choju Jimbutsu Giga, the scroll of frolicking animals and people. But this idea of caricature plays into a kind of Buddhist ideas of being selfless and self-mocking, and so it flourishes inside Japan. Another important thing is that in Japan there becomes a, a very thriving woodblock tradition for popular prints. Uh, the government doesn't control the printmaking as tightly, and they allow for the publication of fashion prints. As you see here in the Edo period, this becomes enormously popular. Uh, this way of looking at uh, these sort of celebrities and uh, their tastes and uh, the way in which they dress, all of these sorts of things. Actors and sumo wrestlers were also sort of featured in these popular prints. One of the ways in which they started to sell these popular prints is to sort of combine them together into sets. These sets uh, were first sort of thematically related, and then they started to tell stories. And these early stories were erotic stories called shunga, or spring pictures. These erotic stories often dealt with the amorous adventures of some person or another often dealing with this place where prostitutes would go. And so in this story, this Shunga style story, this is a story of the little horny Manimo. And this is the last of the 12 pictures telling the story of this man who is traveling to go visit the place where all the prostitutes are. And he says a prayer at a temple so that he can um, ask for the opportunity to witness all this great lovemaking. And so the goddess of love appears turns him into a little man and says, now you can sneak around and watch all the lovemaking you want. So in this picture, we see the little man, Manimon, up in the tree in the upper left-hand corner. And there, there's watching a scene where a geisha has caught her client groping her attendant. And now he's, she's looking daggers at him as he is sort of caught in the act. Uh, and this, everyone looks like they're smelling something a little off. And this is a wonderful scene because we see a maniman up in the tree farting. And this is kind of a funny play on this kind of illusions. Now, I point this all out because this is one of the sort of early examples we have of picture storytelling. And it's a great example of narration, dialogue, sound effects, and all kinds of other things sort of mixed together in this popular print. This kind of storytelling is happening just a little bit later than what Hogarth was doing with his storytell, uh, his moral stories back in England. So these stories are a part of a picture storytelling tradition that uses this idea, what we call a consequential narrative. Because this happened, then this happened. And it sort of spills out from here. These picture storytelling traditions uh, were compiled in little books with yellow covers, and so they were called little yellow books, Kibio Shibon. And they became popular entertainment in Japan in this Edo period, between the sort of late Edo about 1775 to 1806. 
these little yellow books uh, were all the rage. And they mixed together narration, dialogue, fanciful stories, erotic tales, adventure stories, all kind of come together in this sort of humorous and crazy format. Here is a close example of one uh, Master Flash Gold Splendiferous Dream, where it shows a water seller who is a typically a fairly poor person, and he falls asleep and has this dream about being sort of transported to this magical realm. Now, if you look at the page here, this would be read from right to left, as most Japanese is, and you can see how the words just spill over every surface of the picture. And this adds to the sort of chaos and fun of the Kibiyoshi stories. Compare a Kibiyoshi to a much more classical style painting, which has this sort of uh, restraint and elegant um, empty spaces that are meant to evoke, evoke a kind of quiet and uh, a kind of uh, meditative simplicity. Whereas Kibiyoshi is a kind of riot of excitement and craziness. Here we see uh, Master Flash Gold having a dream. And I want to point out this dream here. You notice how there's this large sort of uh, bubble shape that sort of encapsulates all of the left side page and it swirls down into his neck. Okay, the neck is this very sensitive area, very spiritually potent part of the body, according to the Japanese. And this is where dreams emerge. And so this idea of a speech bubble kind of coming out of this person's body, it's not really a speech bubble. It's what his dream is. And this is a convention that begins with what the earlier Chinese tradition that I mentioned earlier, Shang Tu Xiaowen, that one where the, the Judge Bao mystery stories, that convention has come over and established itself in Japan. We see it being used here in this way. And it's also interesting in the way within the dream is both a combination of words and pictures because this royal palanquin has arrived and it's, it's inviting Mr. Flashgold on his journey. Now let's talk about a story that's in your reading. It's a wonderfully fun story. It's a little challenging to read because it does move from right to left. And you can see, again, the way the text it kind of fills up every space. And there's all kinds of dialogue and narration that's going on. So this story, Playboy Roasted a la Edo, um, is illustrated and written by an artist named Kyoden. And I want to point out right now this very interesting thing to compare what's happening in Asia with what's happening in Europe. Remember when I talked about how the printmaking tradition in Europe was largely based on this idea of metal type with wood images, and so that the image making and the word making were two separate skills that were done by two separate clan, uh, groups of people. And so in Japan, where they're using a wood, one woodblock print to make all the words and the pictures all at the same time, one artist is really kind of responsible for both the words and the pictures. And so we see a much tighter and much more complicated integration of words and pictures in Japan than we see in Europe. So in this story, our uh, Injiro, our playboy, is a rich kid who is kind of ugly with his pug nose, who reads a lot of these sort of romance little yellow books. So the book we are reading is a little yellow book, and he is fantasizing about all the adventures his lovers have in these little yellow books, and he wishes he too could have adventures just like the stories. So this is the funny thing about this book. It's a story 
about a character who's in a story about a character's like this. So it's a kind of meta story. It's a story that's sort of making fun of the very nature of the stories that these are about. So it tells us about some of the conventions that are typical in these stories and sort of makes fun of them at the same time. So typical in the story, the hero uh, has all these lovers and exploits, and so Injiro has sort of hired people to um, walk around town and, and try and sell his story of his great loves and exploits, even though they're all kind of just sort of made up. He's also hired these little girls to come and try and drag him back to the brothel where his lover awaits. And so all of these just sort of scenes he's paying to act out uh, actually happen in these Kibiyoshi Bon. He also hires uh, some thugs to beat him up as a rival jealous lover uh, wants to have his um, uh, put down. And so here again, he's hired these guys to pose and, and to make it look like he, uh, he has a rival uh, jealous lover who is stolen his affection from his own favorite concubine. And here we have him now in his grand theatrical uh, expression. He's hired a group of performers to help him reenact his own love suicide. Now, love suicides were a very big thing in the theater and in these stories at this time. This idea of like Romeo and Juliet, star-crossed lovers who end their lives together. This was a very big theme in a lot of Japanese stories at this time. And you can see him now hiring all these people to do this. Unfortunately, his story turns out quite differently. Goes to this area to play act his death when real bandits appear who've come to threaten him uh, and with his life. And so he surrenders up all of his clothing and uh, his goods and is made to walk back to town naked. And so this is the where the, the, the play turns back on itself in a really funny and interesting way. The characters naked are now here uh, made to return from their place of suicide. This scene, this sort of moving toward, uh, moving away from the place of the suicide is inverted because this is where uh, in the traditional story, you would have a story song where people going to the place of their suicide, not walking away from it. And so it's a whole part of the story is kind of inverted. If you notice in the far right corner here is a Torii gateway, and I gave you a little graphic to show you what is actually happening in that corner, because I want you to know that the Torii gateway is this sort of uh, marker of this boundary between the spirit world and the real world. And so because this is on the right side, and we're reading from right to left, they have moved from the spirit world, the world of fantasy and illusions, and now they're sort of returning to the world of everyday life. Kibiyoshi thrived at a time when there was a fair, people were fairly affluent, and um, there was a great sense of sort of fun and pleasure in the air. Uh, the shogunate, the samurai leaders, would crack down as their own finances and uh, came um, uh, under great pressure, and they began to create massive tax reforms and more strict rules about how people should live and conduct themselves. And during these changes, Kibiyoshi was banned. But it's not clear that this actually sort of killed Kibiyoshi, neither the more stoic reforms or the outright ban. It would be another 10 years before Kibiyoshi completely disappeared. And at that time, Kibiyoshi ends in a way that it seems it just sort of lost its audience. Partly it's a shift in taste, but partly it's being usurped by other story films which are a little more serious, um, vendetta themes, or a little more childish, playful, 
and more aimed at the general public and not something that is so literary and sophisticated. And so this is what happens to Kibiyoshi. Kibiyoshi is a stepping stone on our way to manga. It is not manga, and if you know what manga is, but it is important to note that the word manga is coming into popularity at this time, though it has nothing to do with comics. The word manga had been around for some time, but it was Hokusai, a very popular uh, woodblock print artist, who used the term to describe a series of sketchbooks that he printed called Hokusai Manga. And these were enormously popular. And these sketchbooks were not stories, they were just a collection of pictures, things that people might use to learn how to draw. They're strange, they're fanciful, they're demons, they're ordinary life, they're everything imaginable could be found in the many of the um, 13 different volumes that were published between 1814 and 1878. And these volumes uh, became an important way of sort of disseminating Hokusai's name and popularizing this word manga, which simply means uh, irresponsible doodles or quick sketches. Here's another example of Hokusai's manga, where we see all these uh, characters in these very sort of uh, calisthenic poses and exercises. And this was, again, it's like a clip art. It was meant to sort of encourage people to draw in the Hokusai way and uh, to follow his art as a kind of the way to draw. Uh, but it, it never really took off in that regard. It became popular because people were just taken by the enormous variety of images contained in his books.